are certain things that we would like to do which we simply are unable to do. Such as fix roofs, windows and plumbing at healthcare facilities. It turns out we have the only flume tank in the Western Hemisphere. From Mexico to the Marine Institute, finding a way to save the world's smallest porpoise. 95-year-old Sarah Sexton reflects on life and death. Think about it every day. And what do you think? I think there's a wonderful place waiting if I can get in. <laughs> well, we have some flurries in the mix over the next 24 hours. The main theme, though, the cool temperatures that will carry into Saturday. Bit of a messy mix for Sunday and then some unsettled weather for early next week. The details are coming up. Let's get to our top story. We told you earlier this week about the millions in maintenance requirements that are not being addressed in our health care facilities. But where are those problems and why is that number so big? Once again, here and now's Terry Roberts has the story. The buildings are safe. Whether they're efficient is a completely different question. There's no dancing around it. Most of our hospitals and long-term care homes are old and crumbling. 152 million in repairs that we just don't have the money to tackle. We have a very limited fiscal capacity at the moment, so we have to recognize that there are certain things that we would like to do which we simply are unable to do because of uh, the money we don't have. We'll spend 23 million on repairs this year. That won't even cover the largest single category of deficiencies. The heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems. People who build and maintain things call it HVAC. Total deferred maintenance, about 35 million. Millions more in deferred maintenance for windows, roofs, building exteriors. The report detailing all these deficiencies, more than 200 pages. Millions for everything from electrical upgrades, new ceilings, walls, furnishings, even floors. And it's clear there are some big problems with the plumbing. More than 16 million to upgrade the water systems at our hospitals and long-term care centers. Most of these problems and the cost at hospitals in St. John's. Aging facilities like St. Patrick's, the Waterford, and the sprawling Health Sciences Center. Haggie says the problem is proof that public-private partnerships in healthcare delivery is a good option. He says the new long-term care facility in Cornerbrook will be built and operated by the private sector with maintenance costs built into the agreement. At the end of 30 years, we'll get a building that's up to code, well maintained, uh, and uh, that cost uh, is, is, that risk is borne by the consortium that put that building in place. We simply pay uh, a, a regular payment. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Today at the Ann Norris murder trial, the jury heard more about allegations that Norris claimed she was sexually assaulted, as well as more details about the violent nature of her victim, Marcel Reardon. Norris has admitted to killing Reardon with a hammer in May of 2016, but she says she isn't guilty because she was suffering from a mental disorder. Here now's Glenn Payette reports. Today, when one of Ann Norris's lawyers, Rosellen Sullivan, was cross-examining the lead investigator in the case, Constable Ryan Pittman, it came out that in April of 2011, Norris went to the police with an allegation she had been sexually assaulted by a former coach when she was in her teens. Pittman told the court that it was an extensive investigation, but it was suspended after Norris's parents asked that it be stopped out of concern for her mental health. Then, four years later, in April 2015, Norris again went to the police claiming a boyfriend had drugged her and sexually assaulted her. Norris was on a short-term stay at the Waterford Hospital at the time she made the complaint. Her father told the police his daughter was paranoid and delusional. Again, no charges. And just months later, in September of 2015, she told the police she had been sexually assaulted by an ex-boyfriend who broke into where she was living in paradise. The police concluded there was no break-in and said Norris was very mentally ill. No charges. The defense has not said where it is going with this, but has told the jury this trial is all about Norris's mental state when she killed Marcel Reardon. And also today, three 911 calls to the police about Reardon were played. Two of them indicated that Reardon could be violent. I, uh, you can get officers there on George Street. Uh, you might want to send one down to Water Street there, Subway. There's um, a homeless guy there, a uh, great sweater, red, red hoodie. 
uh, Red Hood, more or less, uh, is causing a fight there with one of the customers. That homeless guy was Reardon. It was 3.30 in the morning on May 8, 2016. Reardon would be arrested and released later that day. And at 5 p.m. on May 8, the same day, another call to 911 about Reardon at Shamrock City in downtown St. John's. We're on the flight to Savory. Hey, yes, uh, I'm not saying one, but Marcel is down by Shamrock City in his lower trunk. Reardon wasn't arrested for being drunk that time because this woman, Jessica Peach, who testified today, said she looked after him. Peach admitted that it was perhaps on that day that Reardon had backhanded her in the face. She said it didn't bother her. The day following those 911 calls, Norris killed Reardon with a hammer. She put it and other items into a backpack she borrowed from Peach and tossed it into St. John's Harbor. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. 58 charges filed against the owner of a busing company on the Avalon Peninsula have been withdrawn. Oops, the so English school no, district uh, suspended a contract with Kellaway Investments Calvary last January Connection. when the company was charged for allegedly displaying false inspection certificates. Service NL inspectors allege they found problems with brakes and emergency doors on buses that took 3,500 students to and from 22 schools. Today in provincial court, the nearly five dozen charges against company owner Jim Kellaway were withdrawn. Meanwhile, the case against Janet Jones, who operates JJ Services, which was charged at the same time, will be back in court February 7th. Jones is facing 58 charges of unlawfully issuing vehicle inspection certificates. The new superintendent of prisons in the province has a lot of on-the-job experience. In fact, he's coming out of retirement to take on the new job. Don Roach spent 30 years in adult corrections, the, the most of that time at Her, majority, at Her Majesty's Penitentiary in St. John's. He worked as a duty and training captain before being appointed superintendent of operations in 2008. He retired in 2013. Now, the Justice Minister defends the rehiring, saying that Roach is well-respected among his peers and was the best person for the job. Roach replaces Owen Brophy, who recently retired after working in corrections for 35 years. A customized training program will ensure that gender-based violence... The province is partnering with community groups to offer free legal advice to victims of sexual violence. The program will offer up to four hours of advice to those 16 years of age and older. They hope to expand that age to include younger survivors as well. The program will establish a roster of lawyers who are trained to work with clients who've experienced trauma. They'll be available to clients in person here on the Avalon, as well as over the phone and by email. The legal support program is set to receive $250,000 annually over the next three years. Gone on for years, but we've really noticed it in the past uh, couple of years is survivors are going into court, getting into this court process, and it's difficult. Cross examination, the whole court process. Uh, the accused have their lawyers. We have the Crown, who we, we know what their role is, but they are not the lawyers for victims, and victims feel alone, like they're adrift. So in this case, these people will get specific legal advice uh, prior to that. All right, time to talk about the weather. Ryan is with us, next to us. He's always with us, but he's really with us. <laughs> of course, our minds wander to the weekend. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow's Friday, so yeah. how's it looking? That's right, and again, this is a busy time of year. Lots on the go, uh, especially uh, folks in tournaments and whatnot. Uh, lots of sports activities on the go. And of course, we have to get through sometimes some unsettled weather. The good thing is this weekend looking pretty quiet. We're certainly quiet, but cold. Friday into Saturday, some flurries in the mix. We'll talk about that. Light snow moving into Labrador through the day on Saturday. That moves into Newfoundland for Saturday night, but does change to some showers on Sunday. The good news for you folks, especially in the West, doesn't look like those showers will add up to too much, and we will see temperatures not rising too much above zero. And yes, unsettled early next week. That's the best way to put it. We'll break that down in the next, uh, of course, your long range forecast. We'll uh, dive into the rain, ice and snow that it does appear to be on the way for Newfoundland. Uh, quickly, uh, weak system passing east of the Avalon tonight. Few flurries in the mix, maybe enough to brush off the car in the morning. Onshore flurries, the name of the game tonight in through tomorrow along the west coast of the island. Generally pretty quiet, but again, this is a cooler air mass funneling in through Friday into Friday night and temperatures really bottoming out. 
by Saturday morning and Saturday will be a cold one. Although the good news winds relatively light. Here comes our next system again into Labrador and note your timeline here through Sunday. We go from snow to mix over to some rain showers as temperatures rise above zero. More on your weekend forecast in detail coming up in just a few minutes. Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. Marine Atlantic has finalized its prices for this year and next, and the end result is that you'll soon be paying more to take the ferry from Newfoundland to Cape Breton. There is no increase in the passenger or vehicle fares to cross between Port Basque and North Sydney. However, the cost of a ticket will go up because the fuel surcharge is increasing by 3% in April. Marine Atlantic says it is the first time it's raised the passenger that uh, fee, the passenger fee in seven years, excuse me, the extra money is needed to help cover the cost of using a more expensive marine diesel fuel that Ottawa made mandatory. Tonight, tourism operators are calling the increase disheartening. Hospitality NL says it will continue to lobby Ottawa to stop targeting customers to recover ferry costs. Well, the flume tank at the Marine Institute is playing a role in international efforts to save a species of porpoise that's on the brink of extinction. There are only around 30 vaquita porpoises still left in existence. And the biggest threat to this small little animal is the type of gill net that fish harvesters use to catch shrimp in the Gulf of California. So this week, the flume tank is being used to test new designs of netting that won't harm this small porpoise population. The Marine Institute's Paul Winger explains the project. We're desperately trying to find new ways to catch shrimp in the upper Gulf of California. Uh, many people will know that there's an endangered marine mammal uh, in the upper Gulf of California called the vaquita. It's uh, the world's smallest porpoise. It's quite endangered uh, and a lot of attention is being focused on trying to save the remaining 30 or so animals. And so part of the problem is that this animal is uh, routinely uh, caught as a bycatch. Uh, in fishing gear. So a lot of groups, including the WWF, uh, the, uh, the federal government of Mexico, INAPESCA, uh, even the federal government of the US, uh, NOAA, and here in Canada and, and the University of New Hampshire are trying to find new ways to catch shrimp that don't catch vaquita. So we're looking for um, a porpoise-friendly fishing technologies. In the upper Gulf of California, it's quite a large shrimp and they catch it with gill nets. And of course, gill nets um, are largely invisible to porpoises and that's how they get entangled and drowned. One of the helpful things is that the, uh, the federal government of Mexico has actually banned uh, gill nets at the, at the present time. Uh, and a lot of the fishermen are actually are being compensated to stay ashore. The government can only do that for so long. Uh, this week we actually have some fishermen from Mexico, from the upper Gulf of California, from San Felipe, who are here actually studying the gear in the flume tank. So some of the technology we've been working on this week is uh, more visible, uh, either or, or, or audible to this vaquita porpoise. They can see it uh, or hear it and then that way they avoid it. So we're looking at things that we can tow through the water or things that the, uh, the boat hangs on to called a surapara net. And so the boat tends the gear, we, uh, it stays with the fishing gear. So it's more uh, noticeable to the porpoises and, and they just simply stay away. One of the challenges is this animal is, is quite shy and cryptic. Uh, there's no living animals uh, in captivity. And uh, so really the only solution we can find is something that's kind of an on the water solution. Uh, yes, the numbers are getting very low. Yes, the, the attention is mounting. And now there's this international committee that's kind of focused in on it. So it is grave. Uh, it is quite a concern. There's an expert committee of international gear technologists that have kind of zeroed in on this challenge from as far away as, as Sweden and the UK, the US and Canada. They've identified a number of possible solutions. Uh, some of which, uh, in order to perfect them, they needed a flume tank. And there's only a small number of flume tanks in the world. Uh, Denmark, Australia, France, Japan, China, and Newfoundland. Turns out we have the only flume tank in the Western Hemisphere. So when you're dealing with a challenge in Mexico, even though Newfoundland seems like a long way away, we're still the closest flume tank.
That's yeah. great. It is, it is an interesting story. And there's so much yeah. urgency needed uh, to protect this little animal. Yeah. 30 of them left. Yeah, we had stories this week on here now about the right whale being in danger. Now this poor little porpoise. It was great to see Newfoundland technology maybe giving a little help. It's costing the town of Holyrood thousands of dollars to replace pumps like this one because people here are throwing all kinds of crazy crap, so to speak, down their toilets. Welcome back. Some people in Holyrood are flushing the wrong things down their toilets, and that has the town flushing away tens of thousands of dollars in repairs. Sewer pumps that should last 30 years are burning out ages before they should. I met up with Holyrood's chief administrative officer, Gary Corbett, to plunge into the problem. All right, Gary, let's start off with what is this thing behind us right here? Well, behind us right now, we're at the location of the, uh, what's called the Duff's lift station which is the process for getting the sewer from the residential and business homes on this section of town up to the uh, sewage treatment plant uh, in the center of town. So this is a pump of sorts? This is a pump. There's usually two pumps in this. They're down over five meters in the ground. It's gravity fed sewer into this and then the pump station pumps it up uh, to the sewage treatment plant. All right, now there's a problem in Holyrood. Uh, people are putting things down the uh, toilets that they should not be putting. Well, what's going on? Well, we're finding a lot of issues with our pumps. Uh, we have four uh, major lift stations in town and we have three Abidas pump systems. All of them seem to be experiencing the same kind of problems and that is 
Usually, I mean, the message that the, the uh, near and council have been putting out, uh, is, I mean, toilet paper is, is the acceptable product in, in, the, uh, in the toilets, obviously. When but, you say the acceptable products, that tells me that you're seeing some unacceptable yeah. products. Well, one of the things we're seeing a lot of is uh, the floor Swiffers, uh, the dusting Swiffer types, uh, diapers, all kinds of material that's not going to break down. Uh, in the sewer system. And the problem it's uh, causing in this lift station uh, and others is that it uh, plugs up the pumps and eventually the pumps come to a grind and if we don't get public works staff there in a reasonable time period we burn out the pump. This is costing you money. Well the two new pumps just for this lift station alone not counting all of the other work that got to go with it uh, is over sixty thousand dollars. And that's all because people are putting things in the toilet they should not be? Well, the lifespan of the pumps, you know, are somewhere 25 years, 30 years plus. And, uh, you know, we're not, the last number of pumps that we've uh, put in a number of these lift stations haven't lasted any number in a couple of years. And uh, it seems to be becoming very, very problematic. And where the mayor and council are asking for everybody's uh, support, uh, about residents and business, to please be very careful what's flushed down the toilets. What? What do you think a person would want to actually put a full diaper down the toilet? I'm not so sure. I don't know if I can answer that one, Anthony. It's It, it probably happens because it, it, it may have been an old habit of years gone by. I'm not really certain. Uh, but we do know there's so many different varieties besides the, the clothing materials that I mentioned, those types of things and synthetic products. But we get, uh, we've had face cloths, we've had towels, we've had rocks. Uh, you know, Towels? Like towel. a full towel? Full towel in our uh, main beach lift station. We still haven't figured out how that one got in there. And we've had some other, you know, strange objects and we don't know how to get in there. And, uh, you know, we make all kinds of assumptions. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how to get in there, but they will cause a problem uh, in the town's infrastructure. And as soon as you have a problem with the town's infrastructure, other residents have a problem because they might have uh, backups uh, in their homes uh, and everything else. Stay is there well. no common sense? <laughs> he, did, he did say a couple a couple of years back they had a problem with bacon fat and grease, and so they went on the campaign and said, "Don't stand that." And he said, "People stop." So now stop flushing your beach towels and diapers. <laughs> so there you go. As he said, the toilet is meant for toilet paper and toilet paper only. Keeping you on your feet, the story of an Atlantic Canadian pioneer who kick-started the non-slip movement.
trying to outsmart nuisance beavers in central Newfoundland. The Trouble with Beavers, an archival special at a new time, Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. This weather forecast has been brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. Well, here we are. As uh, Debbie mentioned earlier, a lot of people making weekend plans. It was a little colder out there today when I headed up than I thought it would be. Is it wind chill nasty? Or? Yeah. Roller coaster in temperatures, yeah. as we've been talking Kept about. Yeah. It's been the name of the game from, for January, and certainly a lot colder right across the board uh, for the island. Even a little bit colder for Labrador than we were 24 hours ago. I love showing this map because it, it shows if you're out walking the dog this evening, it, it's a noticeable difference in temperature in eastern Newfoundland, especially. Uh, 12 degrees cooler. This is your 24 hour temperature change map. So basically, yeah, shows the difference between now and 24 hours ago. There are where temperatures are sitting. Minus four in St. John's, minus eight in Cornerbrook, minus 11 in Happy Valley, Goose Bay, minus 23 in Labrador City. And yes, Anthony, bit of a wind out there. As we take a look at the wind chill map, it is feeling closer to minus 12 in St. John's, minus teens into most of Newfoundland and minus 20 to 35 for inland parts of Labrador. Why? Well, the winds are sustained in that 30 to 40 kilometer per hour range, easing through tonight and into tomorrow, though it's still a bit of a breeze, especially along coastal areas. Labrador winds have really backed off as well as our latest storm moves out into the Labrador Sea out towards Greenland. The colder air is wrapping in on the other side of this system. Temperatures cool tonight and certainly over St. John's. We're going to be dropping down to around minus 8 by tomorrow morning sunrise at 734 and we'll be pretty cold through the day tomorrow. Minus 4 wind chill values will be closer to the minus double digits with those westerlies in there. Sunset, by the way, at 452. We're gaining right now about two and a half minutes give or take a few seconds across uh, eastern parts of Newfoundland and across most of Newfoundland right now, even a little bit more through Labrador. Now, as we take a look at your future tracker, we've got those onshore flurries tonight along the west coast. That continues into Friday morning, two to five centimeters possible, especially areas Cornerbrook and south. Uh, weak system passing east of the Avalon, as I mentioned earlier, may bring a trace to a couple of centimeters at the very most for the southern shore eastern parts of the Avalon to dust off the car by Friday morning. Otherwise, it's pretty quiet out there. Winds will continue to ease, but still some gusts in the 40 kilometer per hour range, even 50 along the west coast by tomorrow morning with those onshore flurries. There are your uh, morning temperatures as you head off to work or to the bus. Minus 30 to start the day in Labrador City. Wind chill values will be closer to that minus 40 range when the wind does pick up. Now for Friday afternoon, again, expect the clouds to dominate, but some sun in the mix across the island. Much more sun on the menu for Labrador as we work throughout the day on Friday. Winds still gusting near 40. Temperatures in the minus 3 to minus 4 range for the Avalon and the Buren tomorrow. Highs near minus 6 for central parts of Newfoundland. And steady near that minus 8 range with those onshore flurries continuing along the west coast. Minus 11 to 12 through the northern peninsula, the southeastern parts of Labrador. And highs in the minus 20 to 22 range for you folks in Labrador. Uh, western Labrador, that is. Now, as we roll towards the weekend... Still a chance of an onshore flurry for St. John's and the northeast coast into Saturday, but Saturday is a very quiet day on the island. A great travel day if you have some plans. Snow building into Labrador through the afternoon on Sunday. There are your highs. Again, a very chilly day across the island. Highs in the minus 6 to minus 7 range uh, for most of Newfoundland. A little bit warmer along the south coast. Our next system will spread in for Saturday night into Sunday. And note, Sunday morning, a little bit of light snow, and it's a change over to some rain showers and drizzle into the afternoon. Winds will be in from the south and a little on the breezy side. This will be lingering flurries through Labrador. Temperatures will edge up closer to the freezing mark in the southeast for the Straits into the two to four degree range across most of Newfoundland. Unsettled next week. We'll talk about that coming up in a couple of minutes. Looks like we'll have some snow, some ice, some rain. And yes, it is the season, isn't it? Where ice is on the menu. It definitely is. Fair bit. I, yeah. I'm so tentative going out to the driveway in the morning that, that I don't slip and fall. And how about you guys? Well, I find personally that with one kid in this arm and one kid in this arm, that the balance, <laughs> the balance is actually pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
And if they have big winter coats on, then there's a bit of cushion there, you know, in case you ever have to. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> well, there is a handy dandy kind of footwear that you might know storm treads or crampons, and uh, that has nothing to do with what they're flushing out in Holy Rood. Uh, those are those, <laughs> uh, those bits of shoes with the wire spike kinds of I things. I have two pairs one with big chains. She does. <laughs> One with big chains and others that are a little more subtle. Chains? Depending, cha De depending on what, what the rest of your outfit? <laughs> no. Or the snow conditions? You snow. Do and they the come ice. in high heels? Come on. <laughs> uh, I'll bet you don't know, or I certainly didn't know this, one of the pioneers who actually developed this handy footwear, which sells very well right around all the cold northern countries, is a Canadian. Catherine Harrop has that story. Some go on easier than others. <laughs> Ashley Kenny, Emma MacArthur and Brianna Hicks are trying out different types of anti-slip treads. Well, they were a little hard to get on because you got to like stretch them a lot. Yeah, the bottoms are like, like cleats. Those were the Fredericton made ones. And what these women don't know is that they, they were among the first, the first to stir up the market. The oh, really? Really? Oh, wow. <gasps> That's cool. Peter Baldwin is the retired owner of Icers Inc. But he's back. We are under the gun because we have to get a, some big orders out. and The company scaled back its workforce because sales were slipping. And when the oil patch went down, it hit us hard. So right now we're kind of making a comeback. In the late 80s, Baldwin and Ross Hansen went into business. A car accident had permanently damaged Hansen's right side. That made walking outside in the winter often impossible. He dreamed up the super soul, and with sheer determination, they created a company. One of its biggest clients became the post office. It started getting out there, then everybody climbed on the bandwagon. That ate away a good portion of their market later, as cheaper, sleeker, non-skid treads slipped into the market. We could have made a heck of a lot more money if we'd gone to China. But Icers Inc. didn't move its operation to China and continued having the soles manufactured in Massachusetts, the rest assembled in Fredericton. It recently made a deal with Lee Valley Tools. Ross Hansen passed away last year. One of the most stubborn people I've ever met. He swore he'd never get in a wheelchair and he never did. He walked, even on the most treacherous surfaces. Catherine Harrop, CBC News, Fredericton. I, I think we can't live without a sense of humor. And that's just one life lesson from Tommy Sexton's mother, Sarah.
Welcome back. Oh, Alexis, I stumbled upon Ted in the cafe this morning. He seemed quite taken with an older woman. I can't believe he's still dating Heather. Alexis came by this morning and was really adamant that we go out tonight. Sometimes in life and in love, risks must be taken. The Hyundai Tucson. Can it keep you from hibernating this winter? Well, we gave it all-wheel drive so you can go anywhere with confidence. Standard heated front seats, so you stay toasty. Apple CarPlay, so you're connected. And we backed our quality with one of the best warranties in Canada. Get into any Hyundai SUV with no charge or wheel drive during the I Love Winter event. That's the H Factor. No worries, no problems, no hassle. When it comes to tax preparation, BCJ Tax Center has all the answers. Professional, reliable, and fast. It comes from years of experience. It's a matter of figuring out the tax puzzle, and we make sure all the pieces fit. BCJ Tax Center, the total tax solution. Get a friend to do your taxes at BCJ. Closed captioning is brought to you by Robothan Makai Marshall. If you've been injured in an accident, make the call. Welcome back to Here and Now. She is a well-known local AIDS activist. A role Sarah Sexton fell into after the death of her son Tommy from AIDS more than 20 years ago. Tommy Sexton was a larger-than-life entertainer, the front man with the wonderful grand band. Losing her son was a devastating blow, but it focused Sarah's resolve to make a difference in others' lives. As driven as she's been in raising money for AIDS research and establishing the Tommy Sexton Center, Sarah is pausing today to reflect and to have some fun. It's her 95th birthday. She invited me to her home this afternoon. Happy birthday, Sarah Sexton. Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> How does it feel to be 95 years old? You know, it feels pretty good <laughs> because when I look back, I have good memories. And you know, when I'm here alone, my memories are a great help to me. I have every one of my brothers on a picture over there. I had nine brothers. Mm. and they're all gone ahead of me. I'm the only one left of the 11. Mm. I have one sister. We were very close, and I kept in touch with her till she died. She was 99, 99. She just passed away. Just passed away, yes, in November. Wow. So what keeps you going? What excites you these days and keeps you going? Well, my family mostly, they're all so good to me, you know, I, I don't expect it, but they, they do, every one of them, you know, and, uh, and they have a great sense of humor, and I, I think we can't live without a sense of humor. <laughs> we must be able to laugh because it's so, you know, it, it's like a cure, being able to laugh heartily. Is that what gives you the most pleasure these days, or is there something else that you're involved with that really you love? Well, I love being involved with, with the AIDS people. This is a big thing in my life, and you know, that's what I do now. I knit dish cloths, and I send them over to my daughter, and she sells them. And I keep my brain going, playing Scrabble with Sarah, 
and crib with the rest of them. <laughs> You're very lucky to have family around you oh. like this. And, and Sarah, when you look back 95 years, what life lessons do you think you've learned? Well, I've learned to be very patient. I wasn't patient when I was a small child because I was a, a girl among many men and I had to stand up for myself <laughs> when I was very young. But uh, I think I've learned a lot of tolerance for, for an, an awful lot of stuff in this world uh, because I, I can't be a part of the smart world. I, I'm not fast enough for any of that Technology. thing they do. Mm. And I, so I don't even try to get into it. And I've learned that your hands are so important to you. I look at them and I say, boy, they've been through a lot. <laughs> I want to ask you about as you look ahead, I mean, the, the clock is ticking for you. Oh, yes. You've got fewer yes. year, years yeah. ahead than you certainly do behind. Do you ever think about your oh, dying? And about dying. I think about it every day. And what do you think? I think there's a wonderful place waiting if I can get in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping they'll accept me. Yes. And besides, Tommy is up there. And I know even God, Tommy can make even God laugh. How important has your faith been to you? Look, Debbie, I, I'm being truthful when I say it's the biggest part of my life, even when I was a child. And I, I thank God every day for how good my life has been. Do you know, I've met more good people than the bad ones. There's only be a few and I never think of them. There's, I have one prayer that says, pray for the person you like least. <laughs> I can't find anyone. <laughs> well, that brings me to today, to the celebration of your life, 95 years, and you're going to have a party tonight Well, and we're tomorrow. going down bowling. I love bowling. I don't, uh, if I get a hundred, I'm happy with myself. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to 200 or anything, <laughs> but uh, all my children and grandchildren are with me, and, uh, and they'll really enjoy it, you know. Sarah Sexton, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. Happy birthday again. And yeah. Enjoy your family and your bowling and dancing. It's been wonderful, Debbie. Wonderful. As well. Yeah. That's so sweet. She is, yeah. and you've had the pleasure of mm -hmm. being in her company. Yes, and her children, and the Sexton's certainly a force to reckon with. I guess uh, Scrabble and bowling, yeah. there you go, <laughs> the key to longevity. Speaking of bowling, we're going to check in at the bowling alley to see how Sarah is doing. I wonder if she's going to hit 100. <laughs> and uh, her daughter, Mary Sexton, is going to join us now. We're just having, oh, there she is. There's Mary and Sarah. So. Uh, Hi. How are things going, Mary? They're going very well. Mom's already got 12, and I actually haven't had a turn yet, so uh, she's beating me already. <laughs> and how's her form tonight? She said she's looking maybe to get 100. Well, she's usually pretty good. Uh, she's uh, in, in the past, she's actually beaten with most of us. Uh, but, you know, she takes her time and makes sure that she, uh, she has her proper stride. Uh, we're just seeing uh, some video of Sarah getting ready to throw the ball down the alley. Yeah. Wow. She, the, the first goal, she didn't do as well as she had hoped. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty straight shooter. My goodness. That is something. Uh, Mary, when we were talking with uh, your mom uh, this afternoon, she, she was talking about how important her family is to her, but I want to know how important your mother is to you and all your siblings and the rest of the family. Well, I, I am blessed, we are blessed to have mom with us. And as I say to mom, she can't go anywhere yet. I'm not ready for her to go. So I'm really hoping that she's going to live to at least 100. 
at least 100. And she's very important to us because family is everything to mom and we make a point of getting together as a family and you know we've all like as we used to say mom stamped us all at birth and we all look alike we all hang out together and we enjoy each other's company and we have a good laugh and that's uh, what family sticks together. Well, thanks very much, so Mary. And I think your mom is anxious to get back. Right. And uh, <laughs> she wants to bowl her age tonight. I think. <laughs> <laughs> thanks and again. And it's mom's turn and my turn. Okay. Thank you for t uh, thanks for checking in, Debbie. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let's meet our young athlete of the day. This is nine-year-old Cadence Maloney of Grand Falls, Windsor. Cadence is currently in her third year of figure skating and recently competed in the Snowflake Skate Tournament where she won silver. She also enjoys bowling, there you go, and volleyball. <laughs> right where Cadence, you're today's young athlete of the day. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. So, a little recap now of what's ahead. Did fantastic. you want to make a comment no, about just, Sarah? Uh, she could beat me 100%. <laughs> Last time I went bowling, everybody was saying, you should get those inflatable bumpers along the side. It would really help your game. <laughs> Do you know, she told me uh, that she's been having a bowling birthday party for the last 20 years. She oh, loves it. It's wow. working. And you it's can working. see how uh, yep. active she is. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Uh, happy birthday, and uh, why don't we start with a little bit of uh, weather uh, with uh, North American temperatures, and we've been talking about that all-important jet stream, and where we're going to be seeing things line up for next week will be off the eastern seaboard and into our neck of the woods, and you can see where that jet is uh, right now uh, most active, and that'll be where it's active early next week as well as we see uh, a system developing along this uh, frontal boundary that will be stalled out there. We'll talk about that coming up in just a minute. There's the, where the low was yesterday is now actually pushed off to the north as uh, that uh, graphic should have reset for me. Now as we take a look at your timeline over the next 24 hours to 48 in fact uh, note those onshore flurries that continue here along the west coast two to five centimeters tonight. By the time we get to tomorrow morning, maybe a little bit to dust off the car on the Avalon as well as the system brushes the Avalon. It's well offshore, but its outer edge may bring enough for a trace to a coating. Now, as we roll into the Saturday time period, we are going to be seeing, again, some of those onshore flurries continue in the morning. Bit of a break into the afternoon, and here comes our next system tracking in with some snow. Uh, so that is going to be the name of the game for Saturday afternoon. So a quick look at Friday. Minus 4 to minus 8 on the island, a little bit warmer uh, towards the Buren Peninsula, minus 3 there, minus 22 in Labrador City. And for Saturday, minus 6 or 7 for most of the island from St. John's to Cornerbrook, a little bit milder along the south coast. But uh, overall, uh, Saturday is a cold one for sure. You don't want to bundle up and note Labrador City a little bit milder than the east as temperatures are rising there in that southwesterly flow. And that's the same flow that will then move into Newfoundland for the Sunday time period with some showers and you can see where we are going to be mixing over to some shower activity through the day on Sunday temperatures rising into that two to four degree range as I mentioned earlier. Now watch the setup here for next week. There's our big frontal boundary. This is going to be the load that develops forecast models still trying to nail down exactly when it develops and how strong it becomes when it does latest thinking appears that we'll see snow and ice and then eventually rain backing into eastern parts of Newfoundland first central and western Newfoundland better chances that you'll stay snow with this system I think that we will see a boundary of some ice pellets and freezing rain in the mix here uh, but uh, odds are right now that the Avalon will change over to rain in eastern parts of Newfoundland and then central west more of a snow story possibly even up into eastern parts of Labrador as well as that system slowly departs so the name of the game here were shower and flurry activity for Sunday, although pretty light. And then Monday, turning unsettled Tuesday, Wednesday, really the days to watch next week for a potential uh, system that's going to be tracking through and into Labrador looking pretty quiet over the next seven, though that uh, potential snow later Saturday into Sunday, although light and then cold is the name of the game with that potential snow in the east through mid next week. Anthony. Thanks, Ryan. Developing news out of Ottawa tonight. Federal Sport and Disabilities Minister Kent Hare has resigned from Cabinet. It comes following allegations of sexual misconduct made against him. A woman in Edmonton says he made sexually suggestive comments to her and many other women while he was a provincial minister in Alberta. 
Reporters asked the Prime Minister about the accusations earlier today before Justin Trudeau left the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Really important to believe and support uh, any woman who comes forward with uh, allegations of sexual harassment or, or sexual assault. Uh, and that's exactly what uh, my government and myself, we do. These aren't the first allegations of wrongdoing by Hare. Last year, he was accused of making insensitive remarks to thalidomide survivors and of speaking in a condescending manner to a woman who was fighting for maternity benefits. Hare later acknowledged that his comments are sometimes brash and insensitive. In August, he was demoted from Veterans Affairs and given the sports and disabilities portfolio. And as I mentioned about 10 minutes ago, Hare resigned from Cabinet pending the completion of an investigation. And still with a major shake-up in Ontario politics, Patrick Brown has resigned as leader of the Progressive Conservatives amid allegations of sexual misconduct. Allegations are false, categorically untrue, every one of them. I will defend myself as hard as I can with all means at my disposal. The allegations were made by two women and date back several years to Brown's time as a federal MP. Both were teenagers when Brown allegedly made unwanted sexual advances. Brown stepped down late last night after six key aides, including his chief of staff, resigned. His departure gives his party little opportunity to recover before Ontario goes to the polls on June 7th. And reaction to that has been swift. All of Ontario's major parties held news conferences at the legislature, Queen's Park. And here's some of what was said. I would say to those young women that uh, they were very brave. And I, I want to, I acknowledge that, um, that it was very courageous for them to step forward. And I have to say I was pretty disgusted by uh, what I heard in terms of their story. Uh, and, and yes, I mean, these are allegations, but uh, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to take those allegations seriously. Clearly it was a shock. None of us knew about what the allegations were, where, if there were going to be any allegations, until last night. To Nova Scotia now, where the PC party is in a very similar situation to Ontario's Conservatives. Its leader forced out over allegations of inappropriate behaviour. Sources tell CBC News the allegations involve a female staffer in the caucus office. Jamie Bailey stepped down yesterday at the behest of the party. It had arranged an independent investigation into the allegations against him and found that he violated a House of Assembly policy on harassment in the workplace. There are already more than 20,000 confirmed cases of the flu across Canada this season. The effects can range from discomfort to severe illness. But an Ontario study suggests there could be an even bigger risk. Researchers have found a significant connection between influenza and heart attacks in older adults, especially the week after they initially catch or get infected with the flu. Christine Birak has the details. Isolated in intensive care, 65-year-old Dwight Lemaire recalls the moment everything went black. I got up to go to the bathroom. I didn't make it. I got as far as the door. And then things started spinning and uh, out of control. He collapsed. His daughter called 911. With a history of heart trouble, Lemaire knew something wasn't right. It was just a cough. And uh, every time, you know, I coughed. My heart. His cardiologist believes Lemaire had the flu, which caused his heart to fail. While doctors have long suspected it, a large new Canadian study published in the New England Journal of Medicine has found a significant association between lab-confirmed flu cases and heart attacks. You're six times as likely to have a heart attack during the week after being diagnosed with influenza. Generally, flu symptoms can cause inflammation in the body. All that swelling can irritate the walls of your arteries. If they're lined with plaque buildup, swelling can cause a plaque blockage, preventing blood from flowing to the brain or heart, causing a heart attack or stroke. Some people have low risk of a heart attack and some people are at higher risk for a heart attack, but um, anyone is basically at six times an increased risk. This is a big deal. I think that this really hammers home that it's time to do something. Dr. Jacob Udell treated Lemaire. He says healthy people don't usually end up in hospital with the flu, but that a flu shot can go a long way toward protection. If you can get something for protection, I would definitely advise it. 
LaMaire says he got the shot. Even though it didn't keep him out of the hospital this time, he knows his heart needs all the help it can get. The bottom line is it boosts my immune system, and I'm happy with that. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. Scientists say the doomsday clock is now 30 seconds closer to midnight. The clock, first used in 1947, is a metaphor to measure how close we are to destroying the world. To Today, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists moved the time to 11.58 p.m. The group says the danger of a possible nuclear catastrophe is greater than it was during the Cold War. And they say the decision was influenced by heightened tensions between the United States and North Korea. Our viewer picture of the day was taken today. This is somewhere along the Bonavista Peninsula. Oh, I wasn't going there at all. Uh, Can you name where? Mm, no, but it is a beautiful picture. The colors are gorgeous. All will be revealed after the break. Well, as we wind down here and now, we're going to show you what a quick turnaround in construction looks like. This train station in China was built in just nine hours. That's right, nine hours. It took 1,500 workers, seven trains, and 23 diggers to complete the project. That is remarkable. The station will be a main transport point mm -hmm. for the high-speed railway connecting southeast regions of China to central parts of the country. Right, could have used them at Muskrat Falls. Mm -hmm. The rest of the line is still under construction, but if this is any example, it's not going to take much longer. Look at that, all in a day's work. It's incredible. <laughs> wow. They get things done. It's amazing. A lot of effort. Yeah. A lot and of speed. <laughs> a little bit of coordination to yeah. make sure everybody is on the same page and not uh, trying to do the same task. Mm -hmm. Wow. Great video. Yep. Okay. Our viewer picture of the day was a great one today, and it was taken today. And yes, I explained before the break, it was uh, east of uh, the, uh, on the east oh, side of the Bonavista Peninsula, just east of the Port Rexton area, and uh, Champneys West. Oh, ben okay. Day's Beach, yep. which is a, a new uh, beach for me that I have just learned about today. <laughs> Evelyn Johnson, thank you very much. Beautiful spot there. Looks like a great place to go for a hike along the Thought coastline. Thought you were going to say a swim. <laughs> no, <laughs> too cold. Maybe very pretty. in a few months. Yeah. <laughs> nice That's shot. That's great. Thanks, Evelyn. Thanks so much.
bring on summer. Sometimes I can, yeah, that's I can right. almost feel the yeah. heat. We'll get there. Yeah. That's our program for tonight. Have a great night. Come back tomorrow. Good night, everyone. See you tomorrow.